Hello there, Liverpool family and YouTube family. Welcome to week two of a series that we're calling Amazing. I want to start today's message with a question. Very simple question. I think it's probably something that we've all had to deal with or it's happened in our life. Have you ever bragged about something that no one else saw? Like, did you do something that was amazing or awesome and no one else saw it? And then you kind of like didn't want to tell anybody, but you also had to tell somebody because whatever the thing was that you did was so awesome and amazing. But it's also like, ah, uh, no one's going to believe what I just did. So I don't even know if I should tell anybody. I don't even know if I should go brag about this amazing thing I did. And so then what happens is that there's this tension that gets created when we want to brag about something that no one else saw. And so we have to wrestle. Am I going to tell people that I did this awesome, amazing thing because it's so crazy? They're not going to believe me. Or do I just kind of keep it to myself or whatever? Like, do I brag about this amazing thing that I did? Well, um, the Bible actually speaks about that in Proverbs chapter 27. It says, let someone else praise you and not your own mouth an outsider and not your own lips. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider and not your own lips. Listen, it's just more impressive when someone else sees something amazing that you do and then they brag about it and all you have to do is keep your mouth shut. It's, it's so much better when someone else can sing your praises rather than when you have to sing your own praises. Uh, recently, I went up to uh, the Salmon River up in Pulaski and uh, I went salmon fishing for the first time in my life. Uh, it was a great time and I wanna show you this picture of a fish that I caught uh, while fishing on the Salmon River for the first time. Now, I could stand here and show you this picture and brag about it and brag about this fish for days and days and days. I could brag about how I cast my line so perfectly and the beast grabbed on and we had an amazing tussle. And if I left it at that, based on the picture, you would just have to believe what I said uh, or I can tell you the whole story. So here's the whole story. The fish was half dead. It was barely afloat in the shallows right in front of where I was fishing. Like I could see it, it was like 10 feet away from me and it was just kind of like, like well, life is ending for me and it was just floating. And so what I did is I just kind of dropped my hook somewhere near its face and I just did this a few times and I just yanked and yanked until it finally like caught him in the cheek and then I, tried to like reel him in. And like I said, this dude was basically half dead. So the fight was really nothing to write home about. I could tell you some elaborate tale based on the picture that I just showed you, but no one saw what I was doing. No one saw me doing that. Everybody else that we were fishing with were off in their little spots. And I was kind of standing there all doofy and alone, trying to sneak a fish onto my line. No one saw me, and so you'd have to just trust me based on this picture unless I told you the whole story, which would then you would understand. Now, Steve Hazard, on the other hand, here's a picture of him. He really did catch his fish. Uh, like full on, he cast it, the fish took it, he fought it, and all that stuff that you want to do when, you, when you're fishing, and everyone saw it. Everyone saw it, the whole thing happening. People can attest to what Steve did. People can attest to his fish. His fish was caught in full view of everyone. Mine simply was not. There was one other fisherman with us that day. His name was Buck Lippincott, and he was great at casting. But to be honest, Buck got completely skunked uh, and caught zero fish that day. Anyway, I just have to tell you the whole story. Sorry, Buck, didn't mean to, but I have to do that. Now, in today's amazing story, Jesus does something that if you just heard about it, you would have to make a choice whether to believe him or whether to dismiss the story. If this thing had been done and no one else was around, it would be sus to say the least. However, what happens in this story happens in front of a large crowd. It happens at close range, and it leads me to believe that it is 100% true because there are eyewitnesses and evidence to back up this story. Unlike my fish, there was no one to back me up, and we could all back up Steve's 
story. Today, Jesus does something amazing, and there's evidence and there are eyewitnesses. Now, we're in the book of Mark for today's story, and uh, up to where we're at, we're only in Mark chapter 2, but Jesus has already done a bunch of miracles, and he's healed some folks, and every time he did it, he told them, you know, go keep it on the DL, don't tell nobody, but absolutely zero of those people listened to him, and as soon as they left, they went and told everybody that Jesus healed them, and so as a result of that, Jesus was mobbed everywhere that he went. In the previous verse to what we're going to read today, says that Jesus stayed outside in lonely places, but people still came to him from everywhere. And I looked up that word lonely. It actually means deserted. And I don't want to spend too much time here, but if you just take that passage and pay attention a little bit, it can be said that even Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Creator of the world, went through times of loneliness. And I know that's something that a lot of us have been struggling with lately, times of loneliness, feeling lonely, feeling whatever we've been feeling. And so I would just say, I, don't, I can't spend any time on it, but I think it's worth noting that even Jesus went through times of loneliness. Now let's pick up the story in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. And then in verse 5, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this thing that Jesus says is amazing. But ultimately, at this point, it's like my picture that I showed you. The story is not backed up. There is no evidence. There's no way to prove this. There's no eyewitnesses. Anybody could just say these words, and without any evidence, that's all it would be. It would just be words. But here is the really cool thing that Jesus is doing. He is executing a plan. Let's see how that unfolds in verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? I think it's worth pointing out that the religious people were spending their time sitting and thinking sitting and thinking, rather than doing anything, rather than being about their father's business, they chose inactivity. They chose inactivity. Now, I am not saying in any way that we should just act without thinking, that we should do without contemplating or anything like that. But what I am saying is that there comes a time sooner rather than later where sitting and thinking is over and it's time to act. It's time to act on your faith. It's time to act on the things that Jesus has done in your life. These are the religious people, the ones who supposedly know God, and all they do is sit and think. Okay, so thinking about yourself, what about you or what about us? Do you, do you or I or do we, do we spend more time sitting and over-engineering our obedience to Jesus? Or do we sometimes need to just stand up and act? Like it, it, maybe the time for sitting and thinking and processing is over. And maybe for a lot of us, it's time to just stand up and act on what we know to do for Jesus. I think this is something that we all have to consider for our own selves. Now, on the other hand, I think it's a fair question that the, that the uh, teachers of the law ask. Who can forgive sins but God alone? All right, because up to this point, I think it's a pretty fair question. It's like me telling you a fish story with no evidence. I could just tell you anything. Jesus could just say anything. And at this point, there's no way to substantiate what Jesus told this man, that his sins were forgiven. Well, Jesus is still executing his plan. In verse 8, Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. 
And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. Now, Jesus is asking a simple question, which is easier? And if you're going to do the math here, it's four words versus seven words. But the word count isn't what Jesus is up to. He's about to prove a point. He's about to prove who he is. Ultimately, Jesus is about to drop the mic. Look at verse 10. But I want you to know that the Son of Man, me, Jesus, that I have authority on earth to forgive sins. So he, he says to the man, I can imagine him turning and looking at him, he says to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out. How? In full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus proves that he can forgive sins by healing a paralyzed man. He is proving who he is. He is proving his story. He is proving that he has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he is doing all of that in full view of everyone. Jesus isn't hiding in shadows or telling people, hey, look what I did or I did a thing with no evidence. He is showing plainly and clearly who he is and what he can do in front of everyone. And so from this time on, and even a little bit before this, Jesus never had to say a word really about who he was because people were talking and talking and bragging and bragging. People were telling other people about how great and awesome and amazing Jesus was. No, I, I think this is an amazing story from a lot of different angles. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing crowd that is gathered to see Jesus. It's so big that there's no room left inside or outside of the house. It's a, an amazing story that this group of men brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus. And we don't even know how many it was because it said some men and the dude was carried by four of them. So it could have been five. It could have been 20. It could have been 50 of this guy's friends. We don't know. But I think it's amazing that a group of men wanted to see their paralyzed friend be healed. And they they, they went and did another amazing act of vandalism. I mean, imagine the audacity to show up with your paralyzed friend, realize that you can't get in the house and climb on the roof and rip it off and drop the dude down into the living room right in front of Jesus. It is an amazing audacity. There's an amazing level of faith to believe that Jesus could even do this, to believe that Jesus could heal a paralyzed person. It is an amazing occurrence that a paralyzed man stood up and walked out in full view of everyone. All of these things, <clears throat> all of these things are absolutely amazing. And they could be the content of a message all on their own. But there is one thing that, is, that stands out to me as the most amazing piece of this story. It is when Jesus told the man, your sins are forgiven. This is the most amazing piece of the story because having our sins forgiven is of primary importance for each and every person regardless of anything else. Having his sins forgiven was more important than having his paralysis healed. Having your sins forgiven is more important than your health. It is more important than your marriage. Having your sins forgiven is more important than your kids and your career and anything else that you can think of that is important to you. Having your sins forgiven is vastly more important. Those things are all important. Don't get me wrong. Those things are all valuable and all important, but they do not take precedence over us having our sins forgiven forgiven. And we know this in part because of the order in which Jesus did these things. Listen, church, having your sins forgiven and washed by the blood of Jesus is more important than any other thing that has ever occurred in anyone's life. Forgiveness 
of sins is the most important, most crucial thing that any of us need. It is the most important, most crucial thing that any of us need. It is more important than our physical health. Because look, and we know, we can see in this story, and if we're going to be honest, the dude, the paralyzed man didn't say, hey, let's go see Jesus and see if I can get my sins forgiven. He went to come to Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus because he wanted to be healed of his paralysis. And I'll be honest, if, uh, if I'm that guy and I get brought in front of Jesus and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven and I'm sitting there paralyzed, I might be a little bit disappointed. I might be a little bit like, uh, I didn't come here for that, dude. You see my legs? They don't work. And that's what I need you to deal with. He was probably a little bit disappointed when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. He was hoping for physical healing, but Jesus did what only Jesus can do. He forgives the man's sins because forgiveness of sins is of first importance for all humankind. Listen, you can go to heaven paralyzed, but you cannot go to heaven without having your sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus. The fact that Jesus forgives this man's sins points directly to why Jesus came to this earth. The most important angle, the most amazing thing about this story, the most important reason that this story is significant is because of the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, the fact that Jesus forgives our sins. And even though Jesus did not sin, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin, had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, Jesus makes us right with God. And Jesus is showing in this passage that he came to forgive our sins. Jesus forgives our sins. This is literally the most amazing piece of the story. The fact that we can be forgiven of our sins. And here's the deal. While Jesus was walking around on earth, he had the power and he had the authority to speak forgiveness into people's lives. He could just, you know, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. He had the ability to do that. Well, Jesus died, went into the tomb, was resurrected, went into heaven, and he left his disciples to teach us how to receive forgiveness of our sins. One of those examples comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that says, repent, which means give your life to God, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for what? The forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is straight up biblical teaching from people who were left in charge of telling us how to get forgiveness in our life. When we decide to repent, to give Jesus control, to say, I'm giving my life to you. When we are baptized, the Bible is very clear from this passage. We receive the forgiveness of our sins. And so here's maybe the coolest thing that I can say today. Maybe the most amazing thing that I can say today. Jesus wants to forgive our sins. Jesus wants to forgive our sins. We need to have our sins forgiven, and Jesus wants to forgive our sins. He wants to forgive our sins, but what does that mean? I'll tell you two things really quick. First off, if you've never said yes to Jesus, it means that you need to give your life to Jesus in baptism. Like Acts 2.38 said, repent, God, you're in charge, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is when salvation enters your life. But people will often say, well, Wayne, I don't know enough to get baptized or um, my past 
disqualifies me or I'm not good enough. And I'm here to say you will never be good enough. You will never know enough. And everybody's past disqualifies us from earning God's salvation, which we cannot do anyway. We cannot earn God's salvation. Jesus wants to forgive our sins. We will never be good enough, smart enough, know enough, able to qualify ourselves at all. But the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that Jesus wants to forgive our sins. The only question you need to be able to answer is this. Do I want to give my life to Jesus? Do I want to give my life to Jesus? And if the answer is yes, then you are ready. Secondly, it means that you need to ask for forgiveness. Giving uh, your life to Jesus means that you need to ask for forgiveness. Now, basically on this one, I'm speaking to people who've already been baptized. People who've already said yes to Jesus. And I can say with all certainty that since the day you said yes to Jesus, you have sinned over and over and over again. Because baptism doesn't make us perfect, right? It doesn't make us uh, this, we don't come out of the water and all of a sudden we're this robotic person who just follows all the rules and doesn't, we still sin, man. We still fall. We still fail after we say yes to Jesus. And so we need to ask for forgiveness for those things. Giving our life to Jesus in baptism doesn't mean that we'll be perfect from then on out. And so if you're already a baptized believer, how do you get forgiveness? 1 John 1 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I believe it's the responsibility of a follower of Jesus to recognize that just because they've said yes to Jesus, it does not mean that they're going to be perfect and that we do need to confess our sins to Jesus. We need to confess them. We need to ask for that forgiveness. And I think that this happens through prayer. And it, maybe it sounds like this, Jesus, I have sinned. I am not worthy. Please forgive me. Please help me with this struggle. We are not perfect, and we never will be, which is why we need to continually turn ourselves back over to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness. Liverpool family, there's so much more that can be said about this. There's so much more that can be said. And I'll just say, obviously, we can't get into all of that here, but your staff at Liverpool and your elders at Liverpool, we would love, love, love to help you navigate through getting this forgiveness that Jesus wants to give you. You just have to tell us that you want to talk. You can um, hit us up on Facebook or any of the socials at Liverpool Family. You can email any of us using our first name at liverpoolfamily.com. There's a myriad of ways for you to get in touch with us and let us know that you want to talk more about having your sins forgiven and giving your life to Jesus. Uh, we're ready to do that. So if you're ready, we will be there. We will be available for you. Church, Jesus wants to forgive our sins. Jesus wants to forgive our sins. And nothing proves that more than what Jesus did when he went to the cross, died, was buried, and rose again. Jesus wants to forgive our sins, and we remember that fact every week through communion. I don't think anything proves that Jesus wants to forgive our sins more than the thing we remember when we celebrate during a time of communion. We take the cracker and we remember Jesus' body maybe hanging on the cross. And we take the juice and we remember the blood of Jesus, which washes our sins away. Obviously, these things are symbolic. They're metaphorical and they are fantastic symbols for us to remember that Jesus wants to forgive our sins. And he proved that when he went to the cross. So hopefully right now or some point today, 
grab a cracker, grab some juice, and take those things to remember that Jesus wants to forgive your sins. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you have a great week. Talk to you real soon.